Well, I know there's some kids here, and so I'm going to ask the kids to be a bit involved in this as well. But I, I want you to just think about this. I want you to remember your last interaction with the principal of the school when you were at school. Now, some of you may never had that interaction, but I'm guessing some of you have had that interaction. And just say what you remember of it and how did it go? Was it positive? Was it scary? What was it like? Just think back about that conversation with the last time you had one with the principal. Just have a thing, talk to the person near you or talk to yourself about it. But just have a quick think about that. The last time you chatted with a principal, you talk a bit louder. It's okay. All right, if you're still talking, allow someone else just to have a little bit of a go. All right. Well, some of us, I'm guessing, as we reflect back, it was really good. We had a great relationship with the principal. Um, but for some of us, it was a very, very scary experience because it was not always... Uh, wasn't always about good things. My, my principal in primary school, his name was Mr. Renner. Mr. Renner, and he was German. And his name was uh, Mr. Alfie Renner. And uh, I, I spent a little bit of time in his office from time to time. And uh, the conversations were always this way. Uh, not again. Not again. <laughs> And the worst thing was my parents were teachers as well, so it wasn't a good mix. And, um, but I always remembered being very nervous in his office because what he had in his office, and I, it would not be, I'm guessing, any principal's office and someone might be able to correct this, but he used to have the paddle that would sit on his desk at the very front of the desk which really said that uh, this is here to be used. But I remember that. It was a frightening conversation. It was a very nervous conversation. We're in a series where you look at this interaction with this man, Habakkuk, with God, and you can't help but think, this Habakkuk had a lot of courage. I know when I went into the principal's office, and maybe for some of you as well, you, you didn't say too much because you were a touch scared. One of the things you notice with Habakkuk is he was a very bold guy as you read through this. He was a very upfront guy. Here's what we've learned about him and his conversations with God so far. And it might pop up on the screen here. Habakkuk sees that God's people are acting in, in just horrible ways, wicked ways. So Habakkuk confronts, he confronts God. He says, God, why, why aren't you doing anything? Why are you watching and doing nothing with the way in which your people are behaving? And God responds, well, I'm going to do something about it, Habakkuk. I'm going to send the Babylonians to Jerusalem to judge and to destroy my people for their evil actions. And Habakkuk then comes back to God, his second complaint, as we heard from Clayton last week, another whinge in a sense of Habakkuk, and he says, surely not you're going to respond in that way. Surely you're too holy for that. The Babylons, you wouldn't do that. Surely, God, there's no way you're going to do that. And in a sense, he says, this doesn't make sense. And then what we see at the very end, he concludes this conversation and then he has this single focus, as Clayton highlighted, and he goes to his watchtower and he waits for God. What will God say and what will God do? This is a very courageous conversation that this man, Habakkuk, who was a prophet who spoke on behalf of God, had with God. I'd encourage you, if you haven't already, have a listen to Clayton's message that you can find on our website about how in a deed to whinge how to complain well. And what we see here today, if you've got your Bibles there, is again God's response to this second complaint. So in verse 2 of chapter 2, 
you got your Bibles there or you want to open up on your phone, whatever it might be, says this, the Lord replied, write down, he says, write down, make it clear, declare, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and it will not prove false. Little point here, we'll go and we'll say it again, but God is so true to his word. It will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and it will not delay. See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. Indeed, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest. Because he is greedy as the grave and like death is never satisfied. He gathers to himself all the nations and takes captives all the peoples. Verse 6, and this is where we want to focus from this point on. But verse 6 says, we will, not, will not all of them taunt him with ridicule and scorn, saying, Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself worthy, wealthy by ex- extortion. How long must this go on? Will not your creditors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their prey because you have plundered many nations. The peoples who are left will plunder you. For you have shed human blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Woe to him who builds his house up unjust again, by by unjust gain, setting his nest on high to escape the clutches of ruin. You have plotted the ruin of many peoples, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. The stones of the wall will cry out and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labour is only fuel for the fire? that the nations exhaust themselves for nothing. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water cover the sea. If you underline in your Bible, underline that. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbours, pouring it from the wineskin till they are drunk so they can gaze on their naked bodies. You'll be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it's your turn. Drink and let your nakedness be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming. It's coming around to you and disgrace will cover your glory. The violence you have done to Lebanon will overwhelm you and your destruction of animals will terrify you. For you have shed human blood, you've destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Of what value is an idol carved by a craftsman? Or an image that teaches lies. For the one who makes it trusts his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life. Or to lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It's covered with gold and silver. There is no breath in it. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let the earth be silent for him. I wonder how Habakkuk went writing all that down. But anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about today. (laughs) But anyway, that's where my mind goes occasionally. But here it is. Here's the message. You need to hear this. I want to mainly look at verses 6 to 20. But let's just not forget this, that that God wanted Habakkuk to make plain to, to his people this revelation, that God was getting ready to discipline them by bringing the Babylonians for because of what they were up to. And Habakkuk was to let his countrymen know that the Babylonians weren't, weren't coming in on their own, that God himself was sending them. And Habakkuk was also to let them know that God would judge the Babylonians for their sin. This is really key, just as he was getting ready to judge the Israelites. Now Habakkuk, if you think back of that second complaint, would have been glad to hear that. And then he goes on and it says that the revelation is for an appointed time. Don't think it's not going to happen. 
It's going to happen. I just want to point something out here that might touch a nerve with a few of you, and I'm happy to talk to you about this at any time. I think sometimes we can fall into the trap of playing God when it comes to revelations, prophecies, and the judgments of God. We believe we know what is best, and we even, in fact, know what God is going to do. I can't tell you how many times in ministry people have said to me, Christ is going to come back any day now, any day. As I say to them, as I say to you, it's true, it's one day closer. But we don't know the exact day. The Bible tells us to go and make disciples. It doesn't say go and look in the sky all day. And sometimes we need to be a little bit careful where we can focus on what we interpret God's word rather than, in fact, what God is going to do. He promises he's going to do this, he's coming back, all these aspects, and he is so true to his word as we see in what we read today. God indeed fulfilled what he said to Habakkuk. The thing that Habakkuk does do here, I want to just highlight before we look from verse 6 on, is he talks about two kinds of people. He talks about the puffed up people who put their faith in themselves and the righteous people who put their faith in God. Puffed up people, righteous people. Now the puffed up people are arrogant, conceited and full of themselves. And uh, good didn't come to them. God says there are those who are lifted up, they're puffed up, they're about their own desires, their own heart, and things aren't right with them. They're full of pride. Here's the thing that I've learned over time. We have to fight, scrap, intentionally change, not to be puffed up. Sometimes we can get puffed up. The only way to avoid that is seeking God to continually transform us. God, will you continually transform me to be that faithful person that you want me to be? Or we could fall into the trap of being puffed up. Are you puffed up? The second group, in verse 4, God says the righteous will live by his faithfulness. They're rightly related to God. They live for the desires of God, not their own desires. They know they're saved by grace and they live by faith. They're the kind of person that knows God is at work regardless of the circumstances and the situations that they find themselves in. Their faith is in God. Two types of people he speaks of, the puffed up, full of pride, or those who live by faith. They live a righteous life for God. Through this message this morning, I'm just going to say this a few times. I want you to reflect on that just for a minute. Are you puffed up? Are you living for God? Are you living by faith? Now, God here in these verses from 6 to 19, he talks about a number of woes, and that's what we want to look at this morning. These woes that are coming to the Babylonians. But I want you to do this this morning. These woes relate to each and every one of us here that we need to be aware of. As much as a nation does, I think each person needs to think seriously about these woes. Am I a prideful person? Am I falling into the trap of these woes? Or am I living by faith? Pride was the downfall. Pride is one of the great downfalls. Pride says, my will be done. Humility says to God, your will be done. Pride can corrupt. And we see that here. Pride corrupts through opinions where people are looking for conflict instead of peace, putting themselves before others. And sadly, we've seen this in Jesus' followers, sadly, through this COVID time as well. But I divert. But it's there. Someone once said this, I like this quote, some people are so proud they can strut while sitting down. 
Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. Henry Cloud, the author, wrote when he was talking about pride versus humility, pride asks who's right. Humility asks what's right. Folks, sadly, I could have listed illustration after illustration of Christian leaders, Christian pastors, Christian principals, Christian teachers, everyday Jesus followers, whose prideful, puffed-up attitude led to a destructive fall. There is that many of them out there. How tragic's that? But they were puffed up. So we come to these woes, and these woes start because of pride. And to this day, we continue to struggle with pride just as much as it was an issue back then. We live in a time, we live in a country that's constantly encouraging us bigger, better, brighter, bolder. And some might even say, this might even have a bit of a smell that we live in of a Babylonian type time. That's why I think it's just so important for us to be praying for our leaders. That we'd constantly be praying for the country in which we live in. That it would be a country that's generous, humble, selfless, submissive before God. But we've got a long way to go. So God said to Judah, I'm going to discipline you with the Babylonians. Yet he says to the Babylonians this, woe is you. The wrath of God is coming. So here are the five woes, and encourage you to write them down if you want to. You know, I was listening uh, just this week to someone tell the story of Freddie Mercury, who was the uh, lead singer of the band Queen. And before he died, he he wrote a number of songs, and one of the songs that he wrote was this. uh, Does anyone know what we are living for? What are we living for? I think we will read in these woes what not to live for and at the end what to live for. What to not to get caught up in and what to get caught up in. Sadly, a lot of people get caught up in these five things thinking this is what life is for. This is what brings life. And the first one that he speaks of here. And as I said, don't turn off because you think I'm not a Babylonian. This is for all of us. The first one is this. Woe to those of you who are greedy. Woe to those of you who are greedy. Greed is not a financial issue, but rather a heart issue. Greed is not a financial issue, but rather a heart issue. If you ever wonder if you have a greed issue... Someone once said, ask yourself, am I always in want? Do I always want something more? The Babylonians would do whatever it took to be greedy. They would steal. They they became known for their wealth, but they created that through stealing. They were all about greed. You know, one of the sad things for me is you, you can... Uh, read or even see and watch within the United Nations when those rich countries vote or get angry against the poorer nations because those poorer nations vote against the rich. And the rich actually think, no, 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 we are the rich. We have a right to decide what happens. You don't. You're a poorer nation. Ecclesiastes 9.16 says, Wisdom is better than strength, but the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are no longer heeded. God says, Woe to those who are greedy. You know, someone said the, the Babylonians were the mafia of the day. They would do whatever it took to build up their wealth. Take a moment for a minute, just a minute, to do a little self-examination with greed in you. Are you greedy? Now, most of us don't break into people's houses 
and take things away from people so we can have our greeds met. But maybe it's this sense of being deceitful in a business transaction, doing shoddy work and charging for it, overcharging, hoarding instead of giving, working longer hours for money that takes away time with my family because I want to build up my wealth. I want to build up my super. What do you want more of all the time? Greed has no boundaries, as we see with the Babylonians. There's no boundaries. Woe to those of you who are greedy. It's been said greed can be your bottomless pit. It exhausts you to be satisfied, but you never reach satisfaction. I don't quote Gandhi a lot, but he says this, Earth provides enough to satisfy every person's needs, but not every person's greed. The second woe is woe to you who covet. Verses 9 and 10 says, Woe to him who built his house by unjust gain, setting his nest on high to escape the clutches of ruin. You have plotted the ruin of many peoples, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. They wanted absolute unlimited supremacy, the Babylonians, and they would do whatever it took. And folks, sadly, this continues to happen today. This wanting to covet that of something of someone else's. The desires of one nation over another, another person's over another. To control another is ever present in our world today. To cover what someone else has. You know, the, the amount of bloodshed that's come through this is just tragic. You know, one of the sadder things from a pastor's point of view is you see this in families even. Of one family member coveting someone else that, they, that another family may have. It's just heartbreaking. What is it to covet? To covet is to desire something, to desire or lust after something that you shouldn't be. You know, God was fully aware of this issue of coveting. You look at the Ten Commandments. Coveting comes up. We see it says, don't, don't, don't covet your neighbor's wife. Don't covet the things of others. For a moment, be really honest with yourself. Do you covet something of someone else's? I know I've fallen into that trap. I wish I had that of this. Maybe it's a consuming thought, a pleasurable thought, a constant desire, wanting something or someone that you shouldn't. You know, one of the things that maybe for some of you, this won't make any sense at all to you, but for others, this might. Instagram is one of the great causes, I think, of coveting. We see what people post on Instagram and we go, I would, I want that. I need that. Why have they got that? I want that. Now, there's a lot of good things to do with Instagram and that. I'm not bagging it and telling you to close it down. But if it's causing you to view it and then to cover it on what you're seeing, get rid of it. The Babylonians were constantly wanting more, more cities, more control. It was like a game of Monopoly, like the houses and then the hotels. And I don't know how you go with Monopoly, but I, it's like any sport game for me. If I'm playing with you, I want to just destroy you. And I mean that in love, and I may need your prayers about that. But, but you know, you just want to get everyone's house. You want to get everyone's hotels. You want more, 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 more. I might be playing with John and Mary, but I want to totally beat you. 
I want all your houses. I want you to be in debt. I want just everything. Sounds odd, doesn't it? But anyway, that's how I am. But that's covenant. You just want it all. You covet it and you'll do whatever you need to get it. This is what Hebrews 13.5 says. It says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, and we always quote the la- this last bit of this verse, but we forget the first part of it. Be content with what you have because, Tim, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. 1 Timothy 6 says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. So woe to those who covet. The third one is woe to you who are violent. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town of injustice, verse 12. Woe to you who are violent. These Babylonians, they were wicked. They were terrible people. They did ruthless things, whatever it took to keep their power going. They were done in the most violent ways. They used power in the most violent ways. Woe to this, woe to those who are violent. I'm guessing in this setting of those who are watching and those in this space here, we're not talking uh, to a group of murderers here. Yet it doesn't begin and end with murder when it comes to violence. Violence speaks of physical, emotional and spiritual abuse. It can include constant hitting and beating a spouse or a child. It can be yelling, it can be screaming, assaulting someone. Woe to you who are violent. And I want to just say to those who are watching and those who are in here, that if you're on the end of violence, you need to hear this. It's, it's not because you have done something wrong. In no way do you deserve it. In fact, you need protection. You need to be protected. You should not experience that in any way. And, and I'm always open to speak to people who are going through those times. Well, there's some phone numbers actually in the newsletter of people that you can ring. Matthew 5.22 speaks of when we actually do harm others, that we are held accountable for it. So if you're presently violent, you need to respond accordingly. If you know someone else who's violent, you need to respond accordingly. What they're doing is wrong. Woe to you who are violent. The fourth one is this. We've got the woe to to those that are greedy, those who covet, those who are violent, those, fourthly, who have a looted lewd lifestyle. Woe to you who live an obscene and immoral life. Verses 15 and 16, they're pretty sick to read of what they got up to. I'm not going to read it again, but it was sick. It was horrible what they were doing. They were drinking excessively and dragging people to do things that was just wrong, just sick. James 1, 14 and 15 gives the, the process of a lifestyle choice. It says this, but we are tempted when we are drawn away. So drawn away from God and trapped by our own evil desires. Then our evil desires conceive and give birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. The Babylonians did horrible things to innocent people for their own pleasure. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, are often the recipe that gets people to stumble and fall. Drawn away from God, broken relationships, marriages and friendships. And it's not just the rich and famous, it's we read about them in the paper but it's the everyday person as well. Take this opportunity to do some self-examination on yourself with that, along with the violence, but also on this lewd lifestyle. Sadly, we live in a country that's widespread with this. It's horrible. It's sewers type of stuff. It's just yuck. 
And God says, woe to you for if this is your lifestyle. You choose this. Finally, woe to you, idolatrous, verses 18 and 20. You know, the practice of idol-making and, and idolatry at the time of Habakkuk was big. But the essence of it all was this, that it was, it was worship and placing extreme value on something, on the God that they were worshipping. The point of this woe is to emphasise to worship the one true God and exclusively worshipping God him again god was fully aware of this before we we see the ten commandments you shall have no other gods you shall not make for yourself any other idol of any kind god was fully aware of this but here's the thing with us humans we keep falling into the trap now i know not we don't see idols people on the side of the road chopping away to put up a a wooden idol on the streets or whatever But here's the thing for us today. Our idols look like this. This is just a little list. Our idols are money, power, cars, sport, possessions, work, relationships, families, and the list goes on and on and on. God says you should not have any other God before me. Whoa, if you do. So the question is, where do we place our extreme value on? Reflect on that just for a minute. Is there anything greater to you than your relationship with Jesus? You can hear all these woes and we can find ourselves asking, well, that's all been a little bit flat this morning, (laughs) depressing maybe. Yet, I think sometimes we don't talk about these things too much. But they're really real. And they're in our society today, just as much as they were with the Babylonians, God's people. The same issues were there. They're there for us. To avoid being full of greed. Not to covet what others have. There should never be violence. We should, in fact, be people of peace. Is our lifestyle obscene and immoral? And what do we get caught up worshipping? Is it God? Here's something that I want to end with that I told you to highlight uh, when I was reading out, and it's verse 14 of chapter 2. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of, of the God, of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So here's the thing I want to leave with you. Be a person. Remember the puffed up people or the people of faith. I want to encourage you to push on to be the person of faith, to live by faith and then to wait. God God will fulfill what he has said what he will do. One day he will come back. Absolutely. No doubt. And that's our great hope. That God will be worshipped. That God will be glorified. And he'll reward those who were people of faith. So each day, live a righteous life. Live a righteous life for him putting extreme value in your worship to the living God. Don't get caught up. Don't get caught in those woes. Don't be greedy. Don't be violent. Don't covet. Don't make life choices that are obscene and immoral. And finally, worship the living God. Don't have other idols before him. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much again for 
the truth that is you and the truth in your word. And God, I, I just know, I have no doubt that when these five woes that we've talked about are in our life, there is, it's just impossible to live by faith in you. We just, it just can't be done. And I want to pray for anyone this morning as they've even self-reflected in these few moments that we've given. And they go, yep, yeah, well, I think one of those woes is where I'm, I'm falling into a trap of that's actually uh, causing me to be puffed up. It's causing me to be a person that's not living a faith, even though I've committed my life to Jesus. My prayer for them would be that they would take action on that. They'd make the changes that are necessary. We thank you, God, again, that you love each one of us, that as we prayed even earlier before, that you want to forgive us, you want to make us anew so we can draw ourselves again so close to you, so we can live by faith in you, knowing that you are true to your word, that you are true to us, and that Lord, even, even the prophecies that are made, we see through what has been said of these Babylonians took place. It happened. The wrath of God came upon them. And God, we know also that the promises that you say you will do will come true, including that day when you'll return again. We long for that day. We look forward to that day. So may we, we live preparing ourselves for that, but also living as people of faith for God, for you in the world in which we live. We pray these things in your precious and your holy name. Amen.